tool and Confluence. All right, cool, excellent. Um, and uh, yeah, we're based in Sydney, San Francisco, Amsterdam, and there's a couple of us here from Sydney, so it's, uh, it's, it's great to be here. Thanks for having us. Um, so just a little bit about me. Um, I'm an engineer turned product manager. Uh, I've been doing product management for about three and a half, four years now. Uh, and uh, I spent most of my time in Atlassian working on our collaboration tool called Confluence. Uh, it's a content collaboration tool for teams uh, and mostly f helps them create documents like requirements, meeting notes, specifications, that kind of stuff. So that's where I spend most of my day working on that. Um, I also uh, created uh, team calendars at Atlassian. It's a commercial add-on that we have on top of Confluence. It helps teams plan, track, and manage their events, their team events and their projects. So I'm also the product manager for that um, half a day a week. And um, uh, uh, last year, I spent quite a bit of time working on this project that was across all our tools, uh, and it was cross-product notifications and tasks. Um, and the reason I tell you this is throughout each of these experiences, I've learned a lot about getting feedback. Um, and um, it's been quite challenging. Some have been quite the hard way of getting feedback, uh, and some has been uh, the easy way. And so, for example, in Confluence, we completely changed the, weeple, uh, the, the way people create content inside our tool. Uh, previously, they had like this code-like syntax called Wiki Markup, and we completely replaced it with a WYSIWYG editing experience. So a huge change, and we learned a lot about uh, how to get feedback during that change uh, lifecycle and different techniques we would have to deploy. Uh, team calendars was something that was new. Atlassian was launching a new product and it was something that was new, and we deployed and learned different feedback techniques throughout that project. And this cross-product notifications and tasks, um, it was one of those features that we had a big blurry vision for. Um, and, you know, we went through quite a lot of product discovery and we were unsure who would find this feature the most helpful, what kind of personas or users would use this the most. Uh, and so we learned a lot about um, feedback through that project as well. So I'm going to be talking to you throughout uh, experiences that I've had in each of these projects, kind of like an experience report. Uh, and we'll be sharing with you guys the different techniques that we did. Um, so I hope by the end of this presentation, uh, you'll be equipped with at least five practical tips uh, that you can take back to your projects or teams uh, for building effective customer feedback loops. Just out of curiosity, how many people here actually work in product teams? Uh, teams, all right, three quarters of you. Okay, excellent. So this is uh, for you guys. Um, but before I jump into the actual practical tips, I'm just going to spend a bit of time setting up some context on a topic that's been discussed a bit for the last uh, couple of days, and it's about the build, measure, learn uh, life cycle. Well, he's read the Lean Startup book by Eric Ries. It's been uh, referenced a few times in a few presentations, right? Um, I highly recommend this book. Uh, I learned a lot uh, from reading it. But the premise of the book is fairly simple. Uh, and I'm not going to do it any justice in my explanation right now, so I still encourage you to read the book. But it's all about optimizing for learning. And the faster that you can learn, the more sure you can be you're building the right thing for your customers. Um, and so you're a product team, and you've got an idea, and you're building something. Um, and then when you ship it, uh, you learn. And there are different ways of learning, um, typically measuring through analytics or usages of your, your features. Um, and then from that, you, you kind of you have ideas, you apply the learnings, and then you go back uh, and you iterate over and over again. And the faster that you can learn, the more effective your team can be in making sure that you're building the right tool. And a lot of learning these days happens through number crunching. Um, I spoke to a product manager of a very large organization um, He's very famous, and um, they don't, they said to me, we don't talk to customers. And I said, what? He said, no, no, we don't talk to customers. We spend most of our time just number crunching. Uh, they're just huge hive data stores, looking at analytics and, and all that stuff. And he was shocked that, you know, we spoke to customers on a very, very regular basis. And I think sometimes we forget to get that unsolicited feedback from customers and have that verbal contact or, um, as Jeff had earlier, you know, meeting them face to face and bringing them in your office. So a lot of the feedback techniques I'm going to be talking about is not about number crunching stuff is about that unsolicited feedback that you can get from your customers uh, for the products that you're building. So let's dive straight into it. Five tips for building uh, effective feedback loops. And uh, the first one I have is all about reducing friction. Friction, friction, friction. You need to be obsessive about removing it. And uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, some practical real life examples, like um, a couple of months ago, I was coming back from a conference in San Francisco on my way back to Sydney and picked something up from duty free. And uh, when I arrived in Sydney, I uh, gave the lady my uh, boarding pass so she could get uh, my goods. And in front of me was this screen, and it was, oh, 15 seconds to give feedback. Yeah, sure, why not? I'll just give them feedback while I'm, I'm waiting for my goods. 
Um, great way to reduce friction. They didn't give me a paper or a survey that I had to fill out and then bring back later or something like that. So uh, as I picked up my goods, the person next to me was already filling out their survey and giving them feedback immediately about how he felt their service uh, was working. Or uh, I had to put this photo in. Uh, two days ago, I was in Singapore on the way here. And I came out of the toilet, and there was this big LCD screen in front of me, and it said, please wait our toilet. And so I pulled out my phone, and everyone was walking past, and I'm trying to get the photo of this uh, screen. So it was a bit embarrassing. Um, but talk about reducing friction. You know, you've just used their product, if you use that analogy. Uh, and you're walking out, and they ask you to rate their product. And I presume um, this poor gentleman here would um, be notified of the different ratings uh, that people would have uh, rated the, 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 the product that they just used. Um, sorry? What was the last line? Oh, the screen is... <laughs> I did think about that just before I touched it. I was like, oh, is this clean? Or, um, so, but a, an example uh, that we, d uh, we did at Alice, and I told you about this earlier, we completely changed the way people create content inside Confluence. This is the tool that I work on every day. So this is uh, the main screen of the tool. This is the editor screen where people create content. And what we did was we put this little got feedback button up the top. And it was in context. So we wanted to capture feedback about their editing experience. It was right there. And when you clicked on that, you were presented with this screen. No login screen, no redirect to another website. It was all in, in the product, in the dialogue. It's a modal dialogue, so you didn't have to switch context. And believe it or not, we debated and we agonized over these three fields that appear here. Uh, but it was well worth it. You know, we end up deciding only one in another tool where they need to log in again. Um, you really do want to reduce the amount of fields. Like, debate each field that goes on in that feedback form and make sure you have only what you need. And try to automate things where possible. If you need to capture browser information, you know, technology can solve that pretty well today. Um, as, as you saw in the example of the toilet, and I thought it was a great one, just if that's all you're after, a, a yes or a no, or how do you like this feature, then make it really easy for the end user to express themselves uh, to use your tool. Um, so how, how can you do this? How can you build these feedback forms? Well, there are plenty of free services out there that help you do this. This costs you no money. If you are a Jira customer, which I know half of you here, we have the Jira issue collector, and that's free. But there's Wifu is free, Google Apps, you can use that for free. Heaps of free stuff out there. So it's not hard to do this, and you guys should be doing this in all your products. It's, it's amazing, uh, the unsolicited feedback that you get. My second tip is all about making the experience fun. And uh, I actually don't know, but do you get the biggest loser in India? Have you heard about it? Yes, no, some shit. So it's, it's a, uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, it's a reality TV show uh, where people lose weight and they've turned it into a game. And um, in Australia, we have a terrible habit of copying everything, um, all the reality TV shows from the States. So we have it in Australia as well. And what amazed me is the amount of different editions of the show that they can make. So there was the biggest loser couples, there's the biggest loser singles, biggest loser celebrities. And someone told me there was actually a biggest loser for pets, for your obese pets. Um, which is kind of freaky. Um, but I came back home from work one day throughout this Confluence 4.0 release and you know, the whole changing of the editor thing. And I was trying to think about what we can do to encourage people um, to give us feedback. And I turned on TV and The Biggest Loser was on. And I thought, hey, why don't we create this competition called The Biggest Whinger? And I have to explain what whinger is because it's an Australian slang. It's someone who complains a lot. And so hence the baby uh, having a sook or complaining, another slang term, sorry, um, complaining about uh, this. So we created this competition called the Biggest Winger. And we made it, a, a, we said, hey, whoever gives us the most amount of feedback, we're going to give you a prize uh, by the time we ship Confluence 4.0. So because all that stuff was coming into our issue tracking system, we could easily report on it and graph and work out who was giving us the amount of feedback. And we gave them uh, gold class movie tickets and said, hey, thanks. Thanks for taking time out to give us feedback. We really appreciate it. For Team Calendars, I told you earlier, that was a new product that our company was launching. Uh, we said, hey, whoever gives us the most valuable feedback will give you a free license. You will not have to pay for this product ever again. Uh, we'll give you a free license. And I was amazed at the amount of feedback that we received from customers that, that took time out of their day to give us feedback. Another technique we used, which um, uh, we copied out of, uh, does anyone know of Balsamic? Uh, they're a mock-ups tool. Uh, they do this really well. They're very personal with their customers. Um, they actually call out all the customers that give them feedback in their release notes. And they say, hey, thank you for that suggestion. It made a huge difference, and we implemented this feature. And it goes a long way for that user feeling engaged, and they're more encouraged to give you feedback uh, a bit later. So think about uh, how you can make the experience more fun by incentivizing through prizes or awards. Um, take time out to say thank you. Uh, it goes a long way to show some appreciation for the time that people give you to give you feedback on your products. And um, where possible, think about some game mechanics. Make it a competition or a prize. Um, give some different uh, incenti incentives for people to give you feedback. 
So we've talked about reducing friction. Uh, we've talked about making the experience more fun. My third tip is about getting personal. And I'm not talking about finding your most attractive customer and asking them out on a date. Um, I'm talking about really getting a deeper understanding of your customers. So on my way here, I, um, I emptied out my wallet. And I have this habit of just emptying out my wallet before I travel, because I'm afraid I'll lose all these cards that I never use. Uh, and some of these cards came out. And, and I was looking at them. And, and they're just um, consumer rewards cards. You know, the things where you collect points uh, for shopping, or frequent flyers, or hotel, that kind of stuff. And um, I was thinking about it the other day, and they learn a lot from my usage. As I use their products or services, um, you know, I'm giving up some of my privacy. In exchange, I hope they're going to give me a better product uh, in return. So they're learning a lot about me as a customer, uh, and the different uh, things that I do, or the things that I like or don't like. And so I talked to you briefly at the start about this cross-product notifications feature uh, that we're building at Atlassian. I'm not going to dive into details of that. It's kind of irrelevant. I guess the point is we had this project that we were doing a lot of product discovery. We were not sure on the types of person, types of people that would be using this tool. What kind of role would, or are they in? What kind of features would they like or not like? And so Atlassian's getting quite big now, and we're now 600 people. Um, that may not be big for some of you. I spoke to you, some of you here that had worked for a company that was 23,000 people. Um, but so one of our engineers came up with something quite creative. And internally, because this was all internal, there's not, not as many privacy concerns, we had this giant wallboard. So we got this LCD TV where the team sits, and we plotted a picture of the usages of that feature of that day. And we rolled the feature internally. We didn't tell anyone about it. And we wanted to see who uses the feature. And so we had, uh, we'll take a closer look here. This is not um, this guy's hot or not rating. Um, it's the, his actual usage. So I had a picture of the user. Um, and uh, the key features, uh, metrics that we were interested in about that particular user. And so at stand-up, we'd be like, oh, well, you know, there's John. He's using it again today. Why don't we reach out to John for an interview? He seems to be using tasks a lot. Let's ask him why he's using tasks. What's he finding helpful about it? What's he finding painful about it? And so we use that a lot to get an understanding of who, our, 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 you know, who this feature stuck with and who the persona were, uh, was so we can you know, learn quickly. In fact, uh, their engineer went even further, and I haven't got a screenshot of this, where he uh, drew some pie charts, and because we're, this is internal, we graphed by department who used the feature the most. So we quickly understood this feature was used most about most with business people that had teams working in Jira, but they spend most of their time in Confluence, and we'll be able to zone in on that, 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 that customer of ours so we can learn a bit more about them. So putting a face to the stats, that goes a long way uh, to getting some feedback. Um, you get some engineers, and it's amazing what that does um, in terms of engagement. Um, they can see the people that use their tool every day. And what we did is we got those people that we wanted to talk to that had interesting usage metrics, and we reached out to them for interviews. And we had one-on-one -on -one discussions with them, and we said, hey, what do you like about this? What, what, what don't you like about this? What do you think this is supposed to do? Um, so it kind of helped us learn quickly about this product discovery phase that we were going in uh, for this particular feature. So my fourth tip is um, a bit boring, but you, you, should, you should really think about this. And uh, it's not that hard, and I want to show you that it's not that hard. Have a think about writing a feedback strategy uh, before you ship your next release. Um, I want to give you uh, four basic criteria that you can think about. There's probably heaps more, but this four works pretty well for us. So it may be relevant to you guys. The first one is, is what you're building or what you want feedback for a new feature or a new product, or is it something that's existing? Because how you get feedback for those two different uh, ways is, is quite, quite, quite different, actually. Um, or are you after something internal? You're deploying to internal customers or external customers? Because there's different privacy concerns, and you, you know, getting feedback could differ quite drastically between the, the, these two. Are you after feedback for a specific feature, or are you after general feedback for your product? Because if you're after something specific, you may need to think about having some contextual uh, feedback mechanism for that feature, whereas general, you'll have a general placement uh, of your feedback button. Are you driven by a deadline, or are you just after ongoing feedback? Because you may deploy different techniques if you are driven by a deadline, or if you want something um, you know, ongoing all the time. You, may, you, don't, you don't need to incentivize people as much. So a, a quick practical examples for team calendars. This is the new product that we launched. Um, this was new. And so we had to find different techniques to encourage customers to take time out of the day to install something new. And that's, so that's why incentivizing went a long way. And we, we found some potential beta customers, and we built a relationship with them, and we checked in with them weekly. So we had to make sure it was probably a bit more high touch to get feedback on those examples. Um, was it internal? Was it external? Well, this was both. We captured we had internal customers and external customers. So we learned a lot about um, feedback through that way. 
Um, and for internal, we're a bit more slack with the data that we collected because we could collect a bit more than um, uh, what, what we could do external. It was a new tool. So we're after general feedback. We went after feedback for a specific uh, sub-feature of that tool. Um, and so we, you know, we, we had a big floating kind of button at the bottom that said, hey, give us feedback. You, know, you can kind of close it off or whatever. Um, and we arranged casual interviews for the tool. Uh, for us, we had a deadline. And so I talked to you, about, I talked to you earlier about um, we gave customers a free copy of the software. And so that went a long way to incentivizing people to give us feedback with a deadline. Uh, and we had a follow-up plan. I told you we, we just talked to these people regularly and we checked in with them weekly. Um, so write a plan of attack. It's not that hard. It's probably just a table on a, on a page with a, a couple of paragraphs. It's not, it's not going to take a lot of time. Um, but what that helps you do is um, if you do this regularly, you can start to set a baseline on the amount of feedback that you receive and then set some goals. So you can say, hey, last release we got so much feedback. Next release we're going to try and get this much more. Or, or it's a bigger change, so we should expect to get more feedback. So you can start to use this iteratively uh, as you release uh, more software. My last tip is probably my first, most favorite tip, and uh, a few people touched on this already in the conference. Uh, and just the idea that you can get feedback well before you write uh, any line of code. And um, uh, I think is that a gentleman, Owen? Uh, Owen, yeah, he spoke about uh, building the MVP for the enterprise uh, yesterday morning. And um, a lot of similar concepts with his talk, so if you were his talk, a lot of similar learnings, and I found myself nodding. And we, you know, we, we deployed some different techniques to uh, get feedback well before we start. So a little story to this. I was uh, in Bali. Anyone here been in Bali, Indonesia? No one? Oh, well. Um, or one person. Um, and uh, I was walking down uh, the shops. If you're not wearing a surf brand, you're not cool. That's what they tell me all the time. And I was walking down uh, the road and um, some shops on the side, and I found these great surf t-shirts, you know, Billabong and Quicksilver, and they were like five bucks. And I was, this was great. This was my Christmas presents and birthdays for the next couple of years. I'll just buy a whole heap and, uh, the, the, you know, this is, I'll be the coolest uncle they've ever had. And I got a whole bunch of shirts and I went back to the hotel and I was so proud, you know, showing my negotiation skills to my wife. And I was like, hey, check this out. I got like 10 shirts for, you know, this, this, this many dollars and all this stuff. And she said, did you read these shirts? I said, like, yeah, it's Billabong and Quicksilver and all these cool brands. She's like, no, 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 that says Billabang. It's spelt wrong. And I was like, oh, no, what am I going to do? Um, so I risked it. I, I went, back, went back to Sydney and... Um, Gave my little nephews uh, their t-shirts. I was the coolest uncle in the world. They did not notice. Okay, I thought maybe they didn't say anything about it because you know they were trying to be polite. But they're not very polite kids, so I'm pretty sure they didn't notice at all. Um, but you can go a long way faking it, and I certainly was fooled thinking uh, you know I found these shirts with uh, the, these cool brands on it. Um, but if you can fake it, you know you can save a lot of time and money to get your job done. Um, and so at last, and I want to share with you some techniques that we have done internally. Uh, of a toolkit that we've built to help us fake it. Um, and Owen talked about how they built a static site that had no back end. And we have done similar things and we have done similar techniques uh, at Atlassian. So it costs us no engineering time. As customers come to us for features, we'll do these techniques before we'll even engage engineers just to get feedback, make sure we're on the right track. So um, the, first th the first tool that we have is we have a user interface library. So if you build products, you probably generally have a set of components that you use for your user interface. And we have this static thing which is called a flat pack. It's a massive HTML file with all the user elements, uh, user components, dialogues, buttons um, that we use in our tools in one big file. So we can grab that file at any time. And if you know some basic HTML, you can quickly mock up a screen, put some buttons in a dialogue, and, and get some feedback on, you know, is this in the right location, that kind of stuff. Fairly cheap to do. You need to know a little bit of coding, but fairly cheap to, to do. So that's what we call a flat pack, and that's what we have internally. And you might want to consider doing something different uh, for your software. We have uh, one of our engineers built this really cool framework internally. And my best analogy for it is um, think of browser extensions, but for a specific software, for specific web applications. So he created this, this plugin architecture um, to allow us to create user specific extensions. Um, so they're really just hacky bits of JavaScript, HTML, and CSS that manipulate the page. You know, it's great for the type of feedback that you might want, you might want to get is, is this button prominent enough, or should we do this, or should we prompt someone after they do this task? It's all stuff that you could do with some really basic coding without deploying new software. So he's built it all so anyone can go into the tool and create this. And there are HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And it looks like this, a really basic screenshot, but 
you know, this is, this is Confluence, uh, our product, and in my username, I've got an extension section, and I get a directory of all the extensions that are available. And people have hacked the product to try and do different things, and we've actually found the really popular extension, extensions kind of almost validate themselves. Uh, and they're like, hey, we should take that and bake it into the product and make it a core cool feature. Um, these are really basic things. You can edit the source code in the product, so you don't have to download and do all this funky stuff. You can move, uh, move pages around, that kind of stuff. Really basic. Um, this actual framework is, is open source. It's called Speakeasy. Uh, we have it internally. So you can go check it out and, and see if you want to deploy something for your products uh, that you do, like, uh, you know, to do something quite similar. It's changed the way um, we prototype. It's really cheap prototypes uh, for basic, um, basic visual changes. So if you plot this on a kind of graph of like um, speed at the bottom of how quick you can uh, you know, communicate a concept to get feedback on, and fidelity, whether it's high fidelity or low fidelity, that's speakeasy, HTML, flat pack stuff. Probably in the middle for me, but it's different for each person. Um, I'm not the greatest coder, so it's probably in the middle uh, top. Uh, we have designers, and designers love Photoshop, so um, you know, they can produce good fidelity mockups. They're not quite interactive, but they're visual designs. Um, if you use a mock-ups tool like Go Mockingbird, Balsamic, there's heaps of those free ones out there as well. Um, you can crank something out really quick, but it's really low fidelity. So uh, over the last year, um, I've been thinking about this space a lot because I'm trying to always validate concepts and get feedback as quickly as possible. And I found a tool that for me sits in this top right-hand corner, um, fairly quick uh, and medium to high fidelity. Um, and so to give you an example of what we've done uh, to use this tool, I want to show a video that we showed uh, customers for this cross-product notifications and tasks feature that I've talked about a few times. This is a video that uh, I recorded um, for the feature that uh, we're, we were building for customers. Um, to, you, know, you click on a notification, you can drill down, and here's some notifications here, and um, you can reply uh, to the person that sent you a notification all in app, and you haven't had to switch out in and out of the box. This whole video is, is fake. So no, not a single line of code, um, completely fake. Um, we can reorder things, that kind of stuff. And we showed it to plenty of customers. And as we were showing them the video, they were already telling us, hey, this star thing doesn't make sense. I don't understand it. What is that? What is, that doesn't work for me. Um, how do I add personal tasks? OK, well, uh, let's, let's let you add personal notes, notes up here. And then we also took the video and we showed it to plugin developers, because our products are kind of like a platform. We said, hey, your notifications can appear here. Check this out. You know, you can send notifications in here. This is what it could look like. What do, what do you think? Do you have any questions? And they were like, well, what happens you know, if, if you know, I move this there? And so we actually started getting a lot of feedback before we wrote any code at all. Um, this whole thing took me about two hours to do. Um, and after doing this, uh, we got much faster at doing them over and over again. Um, so that tool is, is Keynote. Does anyone use Keynote or PowerPoint to prototype? Three. Three people, four people. Um, it's changed the way I work. Um, I've found it extremely valuable. Um, I do lots of presentations, so I'm proficient in keynotes, so that works quite well. If you use Microsoft PowerPoint, try Microsoft PowerPoint. Um, it's amazing the kind of stuff that you can do. So I want to give you a, a quick guide on how you can do this yourself. Um, uh, this is the keynote edition. I'm sure there's a PowerPoint edition as well. This is the keynote edition that I demo internally to our other product managers and designers, and they use this themselves to prototype stuff pretty quick or get feedback. Uh, well before we start writing any code. First step, take a base. Make your base like you're making a cake. You need a base ingredient. In our case, it's usually a screenshot of a screen that we want to start working with. Uh, so we'll take a screenshot of that. Uh, and then we'll mix and match some keynote goodness. So that flat pack that I showed you earlier, that big HTML file, uh, I got that whole HTML file, and I recreated a lot of those elements inside a giant keynote file. So headers, buttons, toolbars, form elements, dialogues. I literally just drew the shapes. It wasn't a lot of effort. And as we keep adding to it, everyone shares this library, and we keep contributing to this library. It's got tables, colors, you know, messages, all that kind of stuff, lozenges. Um, so this is a shared library that we use internally. Uh, and you can come back to this and use elements out of that in your prototype. And I'll show you how in a sec. And then last, you just want to apply some desired icing, like you, you do in a cake. Um, so you might want to transition between slides. You can set click areas. Uh, for those of you building mobile apps, Keynote is excellent for that. I'm almost out of time. Two minutes. Um, uh, so I'll give you a quick three-minute example of how you can do this yourself. Um, first step, make your base. Uh, I talked about this earlier. So I'm going to take a screenshot of uh, this tool that we're going to do. Uh, this is a, uh, our support portal, and I'm going to paste it here. So one of our support engineers had this great idea of, hey, what happens if people could tweet their support experience? 
Um, what if they could share their support experience? Okay, so I'm gonna go back to my keynote library that we created for all our front end buttons and components. I'm gonna take a button here, and I'm gonna put a button inside our product that lets people tweet. So after you're working in a support ticket with one of our support engineers, you can say, hey, this didn't work for me. Um, can someone from Atlassian help me out here? So um, we drag and drop the button. We can rename it, we can resize it. It's really simple. Um, I'll just fast forward a bit because I'm getting someone signaling at me you're crazy. Jeff, this is your fault. Um, uh, and yeah, so I add an image here, uh, resize the button. Um, so I'll go back to my keynote file and I need a dialog. So we've already drawn one up with a rectangle. It's, no, it's not rocket science. I'll literally highlight that from my source uh, keynote file and I'll go to my, the one I'm prototyping. I'll paste it and I'll just move some buttons around. Um, this is all three minutes, by the way, not fast-forwarded stuff that I just, uh, I just did. And, um, okay, well, we got some text there, tweet the support experience. We can kind of communicate the concept that we're trying to build here. Um, I'm going to pretend that someone's typing so you can get a feel of um, that someone's actually filling out this form. So I'll write up some text here. Um, and then you can use transitions to communicate that someone's typing. And so Keynote lets you have this typewriter transition so you can make it look like someone's typing and filling out the form. Um, let's do that now. We'll just apply a transition. So select it and you go apply some transitions. Uh, you can go, and, and now we'll actually set a click area so it looks, it's a bit more interactive. So this button, we want it to be clickable. So we'll click that and Keynote lets you link between slides and have clickable areas and that kind of stuff. So we'll make it a click and we'll make it go to the next slide. And that's it, that's three minutes. Well, it's not three minutes, I fast forwarded a bit, but you get the idea. I hit play. This is the concept, oh, there's a button there that we've added. When I press that button, oh, I get this dialogue. Okay, cool, I wanna share my experience with the support engineer. I'm gonna fill it out and get some feedback. Done, three minutes. Three minutes to communicate a concept, get lots of feedback from it. No code, no engineers uh, engaged. Uh, really cheap, really easy to do. It's okay to fake it, so don't feel bad about it. Uh, it's great to get feedback. Uh, um, we saw some great examples of that yesterday as well in some other uh, presentations. Build a toolbox. I showed you some of the tools that we have. I haven't got time to show you all the tools, but those are some of the tools that we have. So have a think about the tools that you can build for your products um, and use the right tool. Uh, it's not always good to use high fidelity designs and prototypes because if you don't want feedback about the design, then don't do that stuff because you'll get someone going, oh, why is that button the light shade of red and they want it blue? And if that's not what you want feedback for, maybe use a low fidelity tool. Um, so have a think about the right tool for the right situation. So, in case you forgot, conclusion, build, measure, learn. The faster you learn, the better it is for you guys, the more you can make sure you're building the right thing. Reduce friction. Uh, we gave you several tips and techniques for reducing friction. Making the experience fun and engaging through game mechanics. Um, get personal. Spend some time getting to know your customers. Spend a couple of minutes writing a feedback strategy. It's not really uh, that much work. And think about how you can get feedback well before you write any code. Um, way over time. Uh, so thank you. I'll be at the back for questions. Thanks, guys.